This video will explain the basics of electronic soldering and also answer some questions like what is flux and why is it needed? What tip size and shape should I use? Can I get lead poisoning from the fumes? And why is cleaning and tinning the iron tip necessary? First, this is what not to do. Putting solder on the iron first and then trying to carry it over to the joint and scrape it off. Applying solder to the iron and not directly on the parts to be soldered is also ineffective. Even if you did get the solder to stick to the connection, it would likely be an unreliable joint that would easily break with any vibration or temperature changes. Why isn't the solder clinging to the joint? Two reasons. Solder won't adhere to parts that aren't hot enough or parts that are covered with dirt or oxidation. In this case, I haven't effectively heated the parts enough for them to attract the solder. Also, although you can't see it, a layer of oxidation, basically rust, is covering the parts, solder, and iron tip, and it's preventing the solder from wetting or sticking to anything. Unfortunately, almost all metals oxidize, and they oxidize much faster at higher temperatures. This is problematic because soldering occurs at higher temperatures, and solder won't adhere to oxides. The solution? Something called flux. It's basically a weak acid that removes oxides and is so essential for soldering that most solder wire has a core of flux built inside of it. After it removes oxides, flux acts as a placeholder to keep oxygen away until solder displaces it. It also reduces the surface tension of solder to help it spread and acts as a blanket to help distribute heat. In the video, by putting solder on the iron tip first, the flux inside boiled off before I even touched the joint, and you could see the difficulty of soldering without flux. When you apply fresh solder to an iron, the fumes are actually from the flux boiling, not the lead. Lead boils at over 3000 degrees Fahrenheit, and typical soldering temperatures are only between 600 and 750 degrees. However, if you do get the solder past 850 degrees, the lead will more readily atomize in the small particles that will indeed float in the fumes. You're unlikely to get lead poisoning from soldering at typical temperatures, but the fumes are still not harmless. Long-term exposure to solder fumes has been cited as one of the leading causes of occupational asthma. Here's the correct way to solder a joint. First, I recommend using a clamp to hold the work and clinching or bending the component leads so that it doesn't move while you're soldering. Also, clip the leads before soldering because doing so afterwards can crack joints. In some cases, you may need to clean the surfaces with fine grit sandpaper if they're heavily oxidized. Also, make sure there's no grease or dirt. Flux can only remove small amounts of oxides. Clean the tip using a damp sponge or dry cleaner like this. The gold curls are made of soft metal and coated with flux to gently clean the tip without thermally shocking it like a sponge does. This can help prolong tip life. It's important to have a clean tip because oxides and charcoal flux residues significantly reduce the tip's ability to heat up the connection. These oxides become harder with time and heat, so it's a good idea to clean the tip every time you pick up the iron. Now, add a small amount of solder back to the tip. This is called tinning the tip, and it helps to transfer heat to the joint and also protect the tip from oxidizing. Now place the iron so that it can heat up both the component and the pad, and add a small amount of solder in between the tip and connection like so. This acts as a heat bridge to transfer heat more quickly to the connection. Now apply solder to the opposite side of the connection. There are two reasons you do this. One, solder will run towards the heat, so this helps spread solder over the entire connection. Two, you ensure that the parts are indeed hot enough to form a good joint. In a good joint, solder doesn't just freeze around the components, it actually forms a metallurgical bond with them. Tin in the solder chemically reacts with copper in the connection to form a connecting layer. This only happens if the components are hot enough, and you ensure this by melting the solder directly on them. Try to keep a fresh supply of flux in the connection by continuously adding solder. Remove the solder wire, and then the iron shortly after. Cover the iron tip thoroughly with solder before putting it back in its stand to keep the iron tip from oxidizing. Ideally, the connection should take only about 2-5 to five seconds to make for typical small components. If you're using lead-free solder, it'll take longer because the solder doesn't wet or cling to metals as quickly. The solder should almost wick into the joints. If it seems to be repelled, chances are the parts aren't hot enough or clean enough. This water droplet on hydrophobic sand is an extreme case of non-wetting. In the electronics industry, an oftentimes hidden cost of components is their solderability, or how easily the solder will cling to them. Components that have been sitting on the shelf for a long time build up oxidation layers that can make soldering very difficult and require more aggressive fluxes. In general, you want to solder quickly because joints become more brittle the longer they're heated. Parts can also overheat. It's a good idea to add a heat sink in between the joint and component for especially sensitive parts, like some diodes and transistors.
Finally, excess heat can cause the pads and traces to detach from the board. After the joint is made, it's a good idea to clean it with alcohol or some other cleaner to remove flux residues, which can be corrosive and eat away at the board over time. This pump bottle conveniently dispenses a small amount of alcohol when pressed down by the brush and keeps the remainder from evaporating. Some fluxes are labeled no clean and may not require cleaning, and others may require water instead of alcohol. See the manufacturer's recommendations. The ideal amount of solder will be enough to thoroughly cover the joint, but still let you see the outline of the wires inside so you can make sure the solder adhered to them correctly. The solder should smoothly meet all the surfaces, almost forming a ramp, and should be shiny in appearance, unless you're using lead-free solder. If the joint is dull and the solder didn't smoothly meet the surfaces, chances are you have what's called a cold joint, where either the target parts weren't hot enough or they were dirty or oxidized, and the solder didn't bond with the metal. It's important that the joint not move while the solder is cooling, otherwise you may get a joint with a rough surface that looks disturbed or cracked. These joints and cold ones may feel solid at first, but are likely to break under vibration or compression and expansion from temperature changes. Worse, these connections can work intermittently and be extremely hard to track down later. You want to use the largest tip that allows you to reach and heat only a single joint. As a rule of thumb, choose one that's slightly smaller than the pad you're soldering to. A larger tip helps transfer heat faster and also acts as a larger reservoir of heat so the tip doesn't cool off while a joint is being made. A chisel shaped tip can heat faster because it has a greater surface area with which to contact the parts. I hope this video helped you get started soldering. If you have more questions, I'll try to help you out on my soldering Q&A site, soldering.curiousinventor.com. Thanks.